Hello, Real Talkers, and welcome back. Today, I want you to listen very, very carefully to this conversation I had with Rabbi Avrami Zippel from Salt Lake City, Utah. He's a shaliach of Chabad there, and he's joining us. Hello, Rabbi Zippel. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us and share your story. Let's get straight to the point. Sure. I was, uh, I began being sexually abused when I was eight years old. Um, my parents started the Bet Chabad here in Salt Lake City. Back then, when I was growing up, there was not any sort of chinuch yehudi here in town. And so my siblings and I were homeschooled. I know that nowadays the term homeschooled has a, a number of different interpretations during the COVID age, but we were quite literally homeschooled. We were at home a whole day, all day, every day. And my parents hired a caretaker to be at home with us to be of added assistance in the house. And she began to sexually abuse me right after my eighth birthday. Um, she had just just barely started working for us at that point. And, and this was a reality that would go on for a very long time. Uh, to be specific, it went on for almost exactly 10 years, a little bit more than a decade. Uh, and it wrapped up after I had turned 18 and she was no longer working for our family. That became my reality that became the reality that I would have to live with and, and face every single day of my life, as does every survivor of child sexual abuse. And ultimately, I had the opportunity to get professional counseling, to, to, to work through the issues that I was struggling with in a professional setting in therapy. I made the decision to report to law enforcement. I made the decision to press charges and, and see it all the way through through a, a, a jury decision at a, uh, at a trial. And it's given me the opportunity to, to be there, to be there for survivors in the Frum community, outside the Frum community, and, and in any community, really, and to understand, uh, I think, sometimes a little bit more close to home than others, to understand the unique experiences of kids, teens, young adults, older adults at some times that are, that are within the Frum community that have you know, obviously various relationships, complicated relationships with the Frum community, given their experiences and to know a little bit about what they're going through. And I think obviously it's, you know, that, that segment of the community is now in public awareness quite a bit more than usual, given everything that's going on. But I think it's important that people realize that they're out there. There's a lot more, I think, than we tend to realize and their needs are legitimate ones. Were you aware at the beginning that something was not what it was supposed to be? Or you caught up only later or when? I, I think I like the way you put the question. Obviously, at eight years old, I think I had the ability to realize that something was a little bit said there. Something was unusual. Something was, was not normal. It wasn't just another regular day at the office with everything that was going on. What I lack the ability to understand is, as a result of that, who, who needs to make changes or, 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 to be more specific, who should feel guilty about what's going on? As an eight-year-old, I absorbed the tremendous amount of the shame and the guilt associated with my experiences. And as a result of that, I didn't have the ability to understand that what was being done to me was a crime. What was being done to me was is something which for which responsibility lays solely with the perpetrator, lays solely with the adult who is committing these actions to a child. And I think that that confusion that I experienced when you when you read a lot about the, the experiences of children within from communities, especially when the abuser is a member of the from community, that confusion is something which you find in almost every scenario is, I know this is not okay, but I know the person that's doing this to me is someone who's so widely respected. Either they're a member of the family who would never want to hurt me, or they're a respected Rav or teacher or a communal leader or whoever it is. So if they are by nature, a good person. And this is something which is not good. I guess the problem lays with me because good people can't do not good things. That's not in the job description of being a good person. And so I think it's that confusion, which obviously allowed the abuse to continue for years in my situation. And I think sadly, it's a reality which we find so often in our communities is it's that confusion about good people and bad people, about putting people in black and white boxes that allow these sorts of situations to continue for years. You kept it a secret and never shared what was going on with anyone. Did you feel you were doing something bad or maybe you were even protecting your abuser? I, in plain and simple English, I didn't report because I, I was going to get into trouble. And I think it's a conversation which is 
fascinating about, about so many of these instances. So obviously there's this natural curiosity. Why don't children speak up? And you know what? This is not the Haredi community's issue. This is a global issue. We know children around the world and every sector of humanity who go through this don't speak up for years and years and years. Why is that? And I think you'd find, obviously, there are instances where they are threatened, where they're blackmailed, where they're warned uh, to some extent, and, and that's a reality. But for the most part, so many children don't speak up because of how they perceive they will be the ones to suffer if they do. If they say something about this, they're the ones who will receive a punishment. They're the ones who will be ostracized by society. And so their decision not to speak up is, is strictly in their own self-interest. Their decision not to speak up is because they're concerned about what will happen to them far more than they have any sort of concern as to what will happen with the person who's harming them. Were you threatened by your nanny or it was your decision not to share what was going on? This is such a great question. I actually, I had this conversation yesterday. I was participating in a training for, for, for prosecutors and law enforcement in the state of New York. And, and this conversation came up, this specific point came up and I told the people who were gathered for the training that when I was when at my abuser's trial, this question was very specifically asked during trial, did she ever threaten you? And the answer is no. And that doesn't diminish from her guilt whatsoever. My abuser didn't threaten me not to speak up, I, I think, because she didn't need to, because I think she understood the nature of the, of the environment that I was being raised in and the world that I was living in. I wasn't going to speak up because speaking up would be, would be incriminating myself. By speaking up, I would be putting myself into trouble. And I think that's a reality that you see with so many young people that are harmed by, by adults in positions of tremendous power, they never need to be warned. They never need to be threatened or blackmailed or anything of the sort. It is the nature of the situation which keeps them quiet, which keeps them silent naturally. It's, it's the exact dynamic of the way everything is lined up that the abuser is guaranteed their secrecy because of the child's fear of something will happen to me if I speak up. Mind blowing. You went to sleep every night with a secret, with fear and shame. You didn't speak to your mother, to your father. Then one day you realize something is majorly wrong. What happened? Where did it come from? I think ultimately it came from more outside influence than, than, than internal courage. Um, I, I, the first person I ever talked to about it was a therapist. And I went to therapy and I, and I told him that I, I think this was the cause of so many of my issues. This was at a time in life where... I had been pushed and strongly encouraged, uh, wouldn't take no for an answer by people in my life who loved me, specifically my parents and my wife, who noticed that I wasn't coping. And, and again, let's try to get into the head of someone who goes through this for so long. In my specific instance, I left home to attend Yeshiva of State at 13 after my bar mitzvah. And at that point, it became a daily challenge for me to bury a part of my life, to, to take everything that had happened to me as a child and just stick it under 50 feet of dirt and make sure it never sees the light of day again. And the reality is that life doesn't work like that. You can't, you can't bury parts of yourself. You can't bury your past and hope it will never come back again just because that's what you wish for and that's because what you desire. And it was affecting every single facet of my life in ways far beyond what I was, what I was willing to give it credit for. And I got married and I had hoped that getting married would somehow be the magical cure and the magical potion. And turns out that doesn't really work like that. And I think for me personally, becoming a parent, um, about six months before I went to therapy, my wife and I were blessed with our first child. And I remember that being a real moment that just pushed me over the edge because I remember holding my son in my hands for the first time and, and knowing that this was going to be a, a boy, a, a young man who was going to grow up and who deserved to have the father that every boy you know, idolizes and admires and is the father who can walk on water and do anything and is all powerful. And I didn't feel like that person inside. I didn't feel like I was ready to be that person for my son. And I was struggling deeply and profoundly. These people who go through these sorts of experiences struggle deeply and profoundly. And my parents told me they want me to go talk to somebody to get to the bottom of it. And that they had no idea what getting to the bottom of it was, was about to look like. But I did. I, was, I figured if I'm going anyway, I may as well do this. And I sat down on the guy's couch and I said to him, I said, oh, I just want to let you know that I'm here. And I think one of the reasons that I'm here is I think I, I wasn't even sure how, how it worked, but I think that I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse. And that was almost six years ago. Next month will be six years and, and everything kind of went, went on from there. 
Therapy turned out to be a lifesaver. But before we get into that, let me ask you, were you scared of your nanny? No, I wasn't scared of my abuser. And, and, and to be really specific, I was scared of myself. I was living in a world where I was shouldering so much shame for what was going on that I was convinced that I was disgusting. I was convinced that I was just despicable. And in my own head, I was, you know, yeah, sure. She, she wasn't a great person that she was also participating in these sorts of experiences. But what sort of from kid does this? You know, I'm in yeshiva with 100, 200 other Bahram. You know, I must be the single most insane person on the face of this earth. And more than I was scared of my abuser, I was scared of myself. I, I, I wasn't comfortable with who lived inside my mind and my heart. I, I felt like parts of me were controlled by an alien, were controlled by a monster, were controlled by, by just a crazy person who, who, who didn't speak up in the face of these actions. And, and that, to be honest, that scared me more than anything, that my system was playing host to, to, that, to that reality. That was more frightening, I think, than anything that you can ever imagine. I saw a sweet picture of you at eight years old and it hurts to look at it for me. How is it for you to look at yourself at that age when it all began? Uh, it's easier now. Uh, I'd say there were probably a good two years or so, maybe two and a half, that I couldn't. Um, you know, to be honest, it's, it's, it's difficult to look at a picture of me from when I was eight, nine, ten, when, when the abuse was really beginning and going strong. It's actually as difficult, if not more difficult, to look at a picture of myself from when I was 14, 15, 16, at which point, not just was the abuse still going on, but I was, I was so conflicted and I was so torn and I was making so many regular efforts to make sure that, that no one would ever find out about it. And I was using such energy and such resources to bury a part of myself, to be honest, looking at that yeshiva bakr, looking at that teen is, is more painful than looking at the pictures of when I was a child and, and the abuse was going strong. You go to a psychologist and you finally open your heart and reveal your story. How did that feel? Interestingly enough, I think especially given my background, being a yid, being a from yid, it is easier to live in a world where you are responsible for the bad things that happen in your life than to live in a world where you are not responsible for the bad things that happen in your life. I, at that point, when I went to therapy for the first time, the abuse had started 15 years before that. So I had lived for 15 out of 24 years at that point, believing that I was the worst human on the face of God's good earth. There was something almost more comforting in believing that version of reality than believing that I had been the victim of a crime, that someone had harmed me as a child. Because when you live with shame, shame forces you to inappropriately accept a certain measure of responsibility. You're a horrible person, but the only person that's at fault for you being a horrible person is you. It's the responsibility that you need to take for your choices. To live in a world where you, of all people, you crossed paths with a predator and that predator decided to irrevocably harm your childhood and the rest of your life that would follow from that childhood, that's a tough world to live in. It's a tough world to live in where someone has the ability to wreak such havoc on your world. And so the beginning of the therapeutic journey, I think a lot of people think you go to therapy and you, and you you find out it's not your fault and, and then it's fine. No, I think you go to therapy and you find out that it's not your fault. And then you really need to pick up the pieces and begin to live in that world where such evil exists, where such hurt exists, where such harm exists. And to figure out what it means for you to, to live in such a world and to go on in such a world is a tall task at times. Were you pushed by your therapist to start opening up and revealing your secret to your family and to those around you? Yeah, I'd like to think that a good therapist doesn't push. A good therapist discusses and, and, and helps you formalize thought and process certain ideas. But I think that the therapist realized and helped me understand that for me at that moment, 
what I was struggling with more than anything was shame. And the greatest antidote to shame is, is, is a supportive environment, is, is people who can understand you and accept you in your most authentic version of yourself and who are willing to provide that for you. And so he encouraged me to start telling one at a time. You know, I, I think a lot of, a lot of times now when I work with survivors and, and I encourage them to embrace the reality of themselves, you know, they're, they're, the question I always get is, so what do you want me to do? You know, put it on Facebook and tell the whole world. And, and my answer is always, no, God forbid. Tell one person tomorrow morning, wake up and try telling one person who you are and what your life experiences are really all about and, and see how that goes. And if that's successful, the next day, tell another person. And then maybe the week next week, tell one more person and you learn to live with yourself. You learn to find that acceptance one person at a time, which for me was a really key part of the journey. Did the dynamic in the family change once they all knew? You know, Adas, I'll be honest with you. I, Oftentimes I work with families in the firm community and there's, you know, a number of children and one child was sexually abused by somebody else from outside the house, from inside the house. <clears throat> and I work with the child and I work with their parents. And at some point I encourage um, the parents to, to share this information with the other children for, for the young person to share this with their siblings. And, and the response I always get from parents is, I don't want this issue to affect the rest of our family. Exactly. I got news for you. If there was a predator that was working in your home and that was harming one of your children, this issue has been affecting your family for a very, very, very long time. And there is absolutely nothing that you can do about it today. And parents like to think that this issue will only affect their family once they've made the determination to share that information with the other children at home. If there was a predator that they were interacting with throughout their childhood, if there was this sort of behavior going on in the home during the childhood, I got news for you. All those kids weren't actually harmed by the predator, but this sort of behavior affected their childhood. It leaves an indelible mark on their childhood. And so, yes, when I shared the information with the rest of the family, did that change everything? I'd make the argument, no. I th I'd make the argument that it, that it helped everyone realize that things had been not as they had expected for years, and there had been a reality in the family and an undercurrent in the family for years, for years and years and years that doesn't begin today. There might be more light that's drawn to it today, but that reality has existed for years. Were you the only one abused out of your siblings? Out of my siblings, yes. I was the only one who, who, is, who was abused by, by this, my, my particular abuser. And recently we actually got information that there's another family that she had cared for roughly at the same time that had a child that she had abused as well, which I don't think was extremely surprising to a lot of people. But yes, in my family, I am the only, the only survivor of abuse, thank God. Was your family supportive of you now that they knew? Did they help you start a new journey? Were they with you? Without question, they were. And I think they were an incredible part of the decision to decide to press charges, to report, to, to go down that road. I absolutely could not have done it without them. Israel, especially the religious world, has been hit by a storm when renowned Uber author of children books, Chaim Walder, killed himself after being accused of having raped and abused women and children who came to him for his advice. His death is like having a rippling effect for new cases are coming out and other serious abusers uh, in disguise are coming out uh, in the religious community especially. But it's also inspiring more and more victims, victims to come out and speak for themselves and to report their abusers. You, Rabbi Zippel, had the courage to report and take your abuser all the way to court and see her finally sentenced, guilty, and put behind bars. I believed that it was the right thing to do. I believed that my community would believe me. I hoped that my community would believe me. And I, I think that any positive thing that a person wants to do in life they can do knowing that they will be supported and encouraged and loved and admired regardless of the outcome of the result. There is something you learn very quickly in the criminal justice system, and this is something which I speak about very often and very publicly, and that is the notion of justice is a complicated one. I think a lot of people think that a victim of a crime really only finds justice if the judge decides to hand down a very, very lengthy jail sentence. And I think that survivors learn very quickly, sometimes the easy way and sometimes the hard way, that justice and jail time 
don't really have much to do with one another. Justice is the, the, the ability to feel believed, to feel supported, to feel listened to, to feel like one's experiences are valid. And whatever the judge or the jury decide to do, and, and, and you know, that's could, in many, many instances is a completely different conversation than crime victims having the ability to feel like their experiences are meaningful and worthwhile and that people care to hear what they actually went through. Our community was never going to be able to provide Chaim Walder's victims with a jail sentence or with, you know, any sort of meaningful punishment. I think what our community had the ability to do and actually continues to have the ability to do is to allow his victims to feel believed, is to allow his victims to feel like their experiences are legitimate and their experiences matter to our community. We are willing to listen to them. We are willing to understand what it means when a young person comes forward and says, this is what happened to them and this is what's happening in their life as a result of that. That is a constant need. And that is something which we have the ability to provide to the people in our community who have gone through these sorts of experiences. And I don't think that that obligation and that goes away just because of how Chaim Walder decided to end his life. I think that responsibility still remains with our community. You were scared to take this out to the public, concerned about your public image. You are a rabbi of your own community. Your dad is a big rabbi. Or you were sure it would only be for the best? No, I was concerned. I was legitimately concerned. I don't know that I was concerned that the Frum community wouldn't believe me so much as the Frum community would adopt the attitude of, you know, this is not the sort of thing we discuss in public. Uh, you know, this, this is not a conversation that we want to have. This is, you know, this is, this is not the direction we should be going in. And I, and I want to share for a moment why I think that's specifically important. There was an article that, that just came out last night digitally. I believe it's in this week's version of the Mishpacha magazine about viewing survivors of child sexual abuse in our community and, and starting to realize that they're out there. And I have to give the author a tremendous amount of credit, and it's, it's, I think it's an article which is way past overdue, and, and it's a reality which is way past overdue, but there's one part of the article that I, that I feel warrants a little bit of context, maybe perhaps correction. The author speaks about the journeys that he has taken to rehab facilities and to visit with and to, and to work with survivors of, child sexual, children, survivors of child sexual abuse that are struggling to, to the worst of our imaginations. And that's true. Many, many children who go through these sorts of experiences, sadly, those experiences become the precursor to so many negative behaviors in their life. And sadly, a lot of survivors end up in rehab facilities. Survivors of child sexual abuse also become Chabad Shluchim, and they also give Dafya Mishiyorim, and they also attend Dafya Mishiyorim, and they also become people who walk the streets of Bnei Brak and Crown Heights and Flatbush and Salt Lake City and everywhere else, and they don't end up in rehab facilities. And that doesn't make the value of their experiences any less than someone who's struggling. What I felt my experiences were an opportunity to share with my community is, it's time that we start thinking about this issue differently. It's time that we stop thinking about sexual abuse as an excuse or as a justification for why kids in our community are struggling and allow ourselves to live in a world where children can go through these sorts of experiences and end up any way we imagine. And that does not diminish from the validity of their experiences and that should only encourage us to embrace wholeheartedly the fact that there are children from every stripe and every color and every walk of life who have gone through these sorts of experiences and their experiences are legitimate. And when they speak up about it, they need to be believed. They need to be heard, not because one of them just committed suicide and one of them took their own life shortly after this whole saga. They need to be seen and heard because their experiences are real period, even when they are alive and even when they are not in a rehab facility. And so for me, that was the challenge. Was, my, was the community ready to, to hear that and to embrace that and to accept that? And, and Baruch Hashem, I'd say, you know, I, I came forward almost exactly three years ago. Next month will be three years. And the community was fantastic. The community was overwhelmingly positive in their response to my experiences. I wish 
and I and I and I hope that the next time somebody comes out in the from community and their and their abuser is not a tongue and guy that they would have the same reception that I received from the community. Salt Lake City is not B'nai B'ak. There's a war going on out there. Those who believe and those who don't. Rabbis that refuse to listen to victims and victims scared to, ru to ruin the reputations for either a good shidduch, a marriage, a woman scared to get a divorce. You are a rabbi who now has become an inspirational speaker for those victims who need your support and strength. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Can we start seeing some change in society? Can we learn from this tragedy? Are we going the right direction? I, I'd say a number of things. I, and let me start with this. If you are a rav, a, a teacher, someone who's in a position of power, and you don't understand this situation, you don't understand what it means to support survivors when they come forward, you don't understand what it means to embrace this aspect of your community, I got to say this to you, you're very fortunate. You're very fortunate that this has not hit close to home for you so that you don't have this sort of personal connection to the story. I firmly believe that the, the world in general, but specifically the firm world, is split up into two categories. There are people who understand this on a personal level, and there are people who sadly will one day understand this on a personal level. The world right now is split into, into divisions of people who want to get this right and who can't be bothered to get this right. There is something to be celebrated, I think, in the midst of the whole Walder saga, and that is that there is a Bezdin in Eretz Yisrael run by Haredi rabbis that was Mekabel Edut that took the stories of 22 brave young women who were willing to come forward and testify about their experiences. And that Bezdin was willing to act on the testimony they shared, was willing to share widely what they did and why they felt that was justified. That's a win, a small win and a small win in a sea of big losses. But that is a win because that is a Bezdin that has shown that these experiences are legitimate and they want to understand what it means for people who go through these. And they want to be the ones to listen to people who go through these. If you are not in that camp, if you are not someone, if you are not a Bezdin or a Rav or a Kahila that believes that these experiences are legitimate, I, I wish for you one thing. I wish for you that you have the ability to understand that before it gets personal. I wish for you that you have the ability to listen to the brave people in your community who want to share their experiences and you can understand it from their lens before you have to understand it from someone in your own family's lens. Because sadly, we know that to be the reality in our community. We know that to be, oh, look, this love believes in listening to women who come forward about rape and sexual abuse. Uh, he's kind of crazy. You, you can't really blame him. He has a daughter who went through this. And that's somehow used as an excuse or as a justification for why they take these matters seriously. I believe that sadly the world will one day come around to this issue when it's inescapable when there is so much pain and suffering in our community that it will be impossible for Rabbanim, communal leaders, whoever it is, to look away from this and to stop covering it up and to stop thinking about it in a certain way because that pain and that suffering will have hit so close to home for them personally. And I pray, I pray that they have the ability to make a difference in this field before it comes to that. To the survivors out there, I would say this. I would say that, you know, there, there's an incredible line in that, in that Mishpacha article that I quoted earlier, and I, and I think it's profound. And the author says, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about getting the Rabbanim to act in a certain way and, and, to, and to believe in certain realities. And the author writes, I've got news for you. There is no global organization called the Rabbanim. The Rabbanim are your Rabbanim. The Rabbanim are that community's Rabbanim. And Rabbanim are forming their opinions, are, are learning the ways to lead Kalal Yisrael based on the facts of the ground. The facts on the ground are going to be things that parents in our communities are going to go to their principals and their mechanchim and their Rabbanim and their teachers and say, hey, I got a question for you. It's lovely, lovely to hear you speak about the lessons we should learn from the Walder saga, Bidiyevet. It's beautiful to hear you speak about it now, a week later, he's gone, 
his victim has also taken her own life. We're all living in the post-mortem world. It, I appreciate all the nice things you've said. What will happen if tomorrow morning a girl walks into your office? What will happen if tomorrow afternoon a woman in your community wants to come forward and is looking for someone to report allegations to? What are you ready to do then? We know, we see realities in individual communities, small communities changing one at a time, slowly, slowly. And that is how systemic change happens. That is how communal change happens. There is no organization called Virabanim that we will go to and we'll dump the whole thing in the mikveh and they'll come out and every rev in the world will have their mind changed. It's slow societal change and we see that. We see that happening in our communities and to the survivors out there and their families that want to know how change is going to happen. I would say one thing, and that is don't stop doing what you're doing because we know we see the change happening slowly and incrementally, and it's very slow. And for every positive success story, we see three or four setbacks, but that change is slowly happening and it will continue to happen. You know, I wanna make this argument and I wanna make this point without, without diminishing a lot of the good that has come about. The Chaim Walder story is about seven weeks old at this point. And suddenly now he's gone and, and all of a sudden it's become socially acceptable to assume that he did it. And Yated Neman is no longer saying Zeichet Tzadik Livracha. And, and now we're, we're having a conversation about taking his books off our shelf. What changed? What changed for so many communities? Was it his death? Is that what we need? We need people to die before we start taking these allegations seriously. Was it Shifra Horowitz's death the next day? Is that what changed our community's mind? What changed. It's easy for everybody now to believe these allegations. And the only question I would ask the community is, when did you change your mind? And what changed your mind? Not because I'm, I think that somehow your sorrow is misplaced, but because I want to know how you're going to handle this the next time. And so is there positivity that's going to come of this? I certainly hope so. You know when we'll know that? We'll know that in a few months from now. We'll, we'll know that when the next allegation comes up. We'll know that when the next brave survivor steps forward and wants his or her story to be believed. At that point, we'll be able to really judge whether positive change has come about as a result of the story. At this point, there's a lot of nice things that have been said about the way we feel about this entire saga. And that's important because those were things that were not being said up until very, very, very recently. The actions that will be dictated as a result of those conversations, those will be the true judges of whether we're ready to make change about this. You faced your abuser in court. She was found guilty. Did you forgive her? Was that some sort of closure for you? Closure, I think, is an English word that doesn't really have a definition that we like to hand out to victims of sexual violence or people who have trauma in their lives and we offer them closure like it's on sale on Black Friday. You know, you can have closure, you can have more closure, you can have less closure. To be honest, I'm not really quite sure what closure is and, and how to find it and where to find it. Yes, I decided to forgive my abuser. And that was a reality that she didn't ask for. That was a reality that I don't actually think she wanted as she, you know, is, is doing a very, very long time in prison now while still uh, completely maintaining her innocence. But I decided to offer her that forgiveness because I decided to move on. I decided that, for that not forgiving means carrying around a tremendous amount of resentment for the rest of my life. And that was something which I wasn't interested in doing. And so I made the decision to forgive. I think it's important to make that point because there's a lot of talk of, well, you know, you forgave your abuser. Why don't you encourage other people to forgive? And Forgiveness is an extremely personal decision. Forgiveness is, is no one's place to suggest to another person, you know, I forgave and it worked for me, perhaps you should too. It's, it's a strictly, strictly personal decision. But I forgave. I forgave because, not because of a guilty verdict, and I forgave not because of a, a lengthy jail sentence. I forgave because I was ready to move on with my life and to stop living with that anger and that pain and that resentment in my own heart. And so I made the decision to move on on my own terms. And it's, it's, a, it's a decision which some people decide to make and others don't. And, and each, of those each of those experiences is equally valid. Is it possible to move on after an abuse and lead a normal and happy life? I mean, you're married and you have children of your own. You've become an ambassador for those who were abused. You're an, inspir you're an inspirational speaker and you speak all over the world. Talk to the victims who are watching you now, and what would you say to them? 
I think the best answer to that question, somebody once told me that normal is a setting on a washing machine, not much else. I think so. I think it's possible to grow from these experiences. I think it's possible to be a healthy and active part of society. I'd like to believe that I lead a somewhat healthy life and I'm a healthy and active member of society. I think it's important to realize that these things never leave you. These experiences never, never kind of give you the ability to just walk away and move on. I think move on is, is a difficult is a difficult term to use as it has this connotation of, you know, you, you, you'll move on to a headspace where that reality won't bother you anymore. And that's not accurate. That's, that's not actually what happens. You, you grow from them. You move on, notwithstanding what happened. You, you grow with these things in your past, with these things continuing to influence a large part of your life. And, and I think the greatest source of healing is the ability to provide that comfort and support to the folks that come after you, to the folks that come that come behind you. And, and, and that really is the greatest indication of being able to function and to live and to grow, notwithstanding what happened. I believe you have a mission now, and I think you also found yourself a sort of a new uh, path for you, which is talking and inspiring and helping mm, victims to deal with it, to come out. If you could speak now to, to the, let's say there's a victim, I mean, I'm sure there is victims who are going to watch this conversation. What, what would you tell them? What would you say to them? I think I would tell them that at times we look at, we look at healing as us against the world and, and we're concerned about the way the world will, will view me and, and you know, the way the whole community will view me and the way Hamodia will view me or the way Ami will view me. If you're a survivor out there, I, I want you to know this and I want you to hear this. I believe you. I believe that what you say happened to you happened exactly as you describe it. And I believe that you deserve to live in a world surrounded by people who offer you that same support. And you can find that. You can find that in B'nai Barak, I believe. You can find that in the Haredi community. You can find that in the Hasidic community. You can find that in the Chabad community or the Sathmar community or any other community you live in. You can find it outside the from community as well. The key point is that you feel like your experiences are legitimate and you never feel like another person's judgment of your experiences should compel you or force you or corner you to have to change your version of reality a certain way to conform with other people's comfort level. And I think you can find that in whatever circle you look for it. I, I think that thinking about this as how will everyone view me is less important as finding the individuals in your life that can look at you and should look at you the way you deserve to be looked at. And if you need help finding that source of comfort, finding that source of support, please don't hesitate to reach out because I'd like to be that support for you. And I believe that I can help you find that support in whatever community you look for it. Okay, just before closing, do you have Chaim Walder's books in your house? I don't. Did you ever read them? I did. And, and I'm gonna, I want to answer that question. I want to answer that question twofold. I did read Chaim Walder's books. As a kid, as an adult, as a yeshiva bacher, I read Chaim Walder's books. And I believe that there's value in Chaim Walder's books. I think they were good books. And I think that as a community, we get so stuck in a black and white conversation. His books, his books are horrible. They're evil. His, his books had good content. His books had good content. There were powerful lessons for our children to learn from those books. Now, is it possible that the same children that were telling him those stories were the ones that he was raping and abusing? It's possible. There was value in those books. And notwithstanding that, I don't believe that you should have those books in your house. I don't have those books in my house. And I want to make an interesting point to your audience, Hadassah. A few months ago, we taught a course here at my Bet Chabad about anti-Semitism. And one of the questions we talked about in that course is how do you determine what is legitimate criticism of, let's say, the Israeli government or of Jews out there who do inappropriate things and anti-Semitism? At the end of the day, 
the Israeli government can be blamed for certain realities. Jews can be blamed for certain realities. And at times it becomes anti-Semitic. How do you know where it ends up on what side of the scale? So Natan Sharansky actually has a whole thought process about this. And we talked about this in the class. And, and one of the tests that he uses to determine whether it's legitimate criticism or whether it's anti-Semitism is the notion of a double standard. If you criticize the Israeli government for doing X, but you don't criticize, for example, the Australian government for doing X, that's not legitimate criticism, that's anti-Semitism. I have one question. If 22 people would have come forward in Bnei Brak saying that Chaim Walder had a television in his home and would watch the news every night, how would that community handle his books? If 22 people came forward and said that Chaim Walder sat next to a woman on an airplane and read a secular newspaper, how would that community handle his books? If someone came forward, 22 people came forward and said that Chaim Walder trimmed his beard, how would the community handle his books? If 22 people saw Chaim Walder attending a course at a missionary institute in Eretz Yisrael or outside of Eretz Yisrael, how would the community handle his books? If you feel like the answer to any of those questions is, no, I'm sorry, that's, that's a line too far. You cross that line. I don't care about the value in the books. We get those books out of my house. Then I think that's fair. If you would answer any of those questions by saying, eh, I don't know, you know, there's good content in the books and, and, and that's not the way you'd handle the situation, that is a double standard. From Weinstein to Epstein to Ghislaine Maxwell and back to Wolver, those who thought they were untouchable all end up paying the price for what they did. Do they? Statistics show, and this is a statistic around the wider community, I, I would actually say it's less within the firm community. Statistics show that approximately 4% of sexual assault incidents get prosecuted and taken to trial, and the number of convictions that come back from a jury is actually less than 4%. For every Harvey Weinstein and Jelaine Maxwell and Chaim Walder that somehow seem to have met their demise at the hands of their victims to a certain extent, I think Chaim Walder is obviously a very different kettle of fish as there was no trial or a, or a guilty verdict. I would make the argument that there are hundreds of folks just like them that are walking the streets and living comfortably. Living in a society where we encourage people to only seek a guilty verdict, to use a guilty verdict in a courtroom as the ultimate determination of, of vindication and justice, I don't think is a healthy way for our society to process that sort of information because it is. It is a bar that very, very, very few people get to cross. And for me, being mindful of that reality was something which kept me very grateful throughout the trial process. The trial process is brutal. It's difficult. And for me, being able to be mindful of the fact that I had the ability to prosecute my abuser, to testify at her trial, to point her out in the courtroom, to make sure that she had to go through that until the end, which is something which over 90% of my fellow survivors don't get that chance, was something which kept me very grateful. But the point that I want to make is, I think encouraging people to think about a guilty verdict being the ultimate determination of justice and belief and comfort might not be the healthiest way to go about it. We need to create systems where survivors feel believed and heard and supported and loved by their communities, whether or not charges will be filed, whether or not it will go to trial, whether or not law enforcement will be believed, we need to be creating those systems within our own communities and not leaving it to a jury. Thank you so much, Rabbi Zippel. You're a living example for survivors. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Your words will be gold to many who will watch this talk. And thank you for being so clear and inspiring. Hope to see you soon here in our studio in Jerusalem. Please, Hashem. please continue what you're doing from strength to strength. Thank you so much. Hope this conversation was inspiring for all of you. Thank you so much and see you next time.